Sing We Now Noel. Oh, that's so beautiful. Thank you so much, Ben and Levi. Awesome. Again, I just always like to brag on our musicians. We have such incredible musicians. All right, we are going to continue uh, this week uh, on, on our series uh, 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 in Thessalonians, but specifically on uh, how does Satan hinder us? How does Satan hinder us? And we've been looking at 1 Corinthians 2, verses 13 through 20, but we haven't really finished with verses 17 and 18, which says, you know, Satan is our adversary. He is our enemy. And he does not only want to destroy our life here and now. He came to steal, kill, and destroy. But he wants to destroy people's lives forever. And so let's go ahead and read our text and we're just going to be looking at these two verses this morning in a continuation of what we started a couple of weeks ago, okay? But we, brethren, having been taken away from you for a short time in presence, not in heart, endeavored more eagerly to see you, your face, with great desire. Therefore, we wanted to come to you, even I, Paul, time and again, but Satan hindered us. But Satan hindered us. We're going to explore that some more this morning. How does the evil one hinder Christians? He cannot take your salvation, but he can hinder you. Join me in prayer. Father God, I ask that your blessing would be upon the service as it already has been. We know that you are the unseen guest here this morning where two or three are gathered together in your name. You are here in our midst. And Lord, I just pray that you would speak to our hearts today through your word, that we would be vigilant and watchful. And Lord, that we would be able to resist the evil one, Lord, that we would be able to triumph over him. You have given us that ability to do that. And so, Lord, um, watch over us. Keep your angels around us this morning and speak to every heart. Those that are here in the sanctuary and those that are listening on social media and I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I was uh, Googling something uh, this week, and, and it was the crab spider of the Amazon, uh, along the Amazon River. And it dwells in other places. But the crab spider is very interesting. It kind of looks like a little crab, but it's almost like a chameleon because it can hide in flowers. And it can adapt and change color to match the color of the flower that it's, that it's in. And so I was watching some videos of that and it's, it's amazing. And so a little bee or an ant or a, a butterfly will come in there to this flower and they will come in there unsuspecting, thinking they're going to get some nectar and that spider just reaches out, grabs them and injects venom into them and kills them and traps them. Now, as I said, Satan cannot take away our salvation, but he can trap us. And a lot of times he lures us into a blossom of disobedience, a flower that God said, don't touch that flower, don't go there. And we go there and he entraps us. He hinders us. And so the Bible calls him the devil, Satan, the accuser, Beelzebub, the ruler of this world, the God of this age. And we know that the Bible says he roams around like a, a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. He may devour. And so what we understood last time we looked at this is that for us as believers, God has Satan on a leash. And basically he has to get God's permission to come to us or come at us and we're going to examine the ways that he does uh, does that and it's interesting to note that part of our sanctification is fighting the good fight of faith it's going through you know fighting evil and standing with god for 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 the good and the righteousness that god represents in this world and so we are being basically prepared for heaven through this warfare and remember, Adam and Eve, they should not, you know, eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. They didn't know evil, but they knew it after they disobeyed God. And Satan did not have dominion over them before that, 
But after that, he had dominion over mankind. And only through Jesus Christ can we be rescued from his power. Okay? A lot of people are unwittingly in that trap of darkness and they do not understand it. They are being deceived. And so he is refining us through this, this battle that we're in. And God has given us the ability to, to overcome him. Now, again, in our text, Paul doesn't describe how Satan hindered him. He just said, Satan hindered us. Actually, he says us. And so we don't know if it was at the church of Corinth. Uh, that where he was having a lot of problems and he was not able to come to them at that time. We don't know if it was because of the large bond that Jason and other Christians had put up at Thessalonica that would be forfeited had he come back and caused trouble. We don't know if he was sick or injured or whether possibly even Silas or Timothy were, were, uh, had some other problems. But he said, Satan hindered us. And so we know we, we have to be aware that we have an adversary. We have an adversary. And when you basically do something that you shouldn't do, you give him permission to come in and mess with your life. And that's his number one tactic of attacking Christians. Number one, Satan's most often used method of hindering believers is by tempting them to make sinful decisions. All right? Adam and Eve, he couldn't, uh, he couldn't overpower them, but he caused them to fall into disobedience through sinful decisions. Uh, consequently, their downfall is self-inflicted. He tries to get believers to stumble through selfishness, unbelief, pride, addictions, ignorance, fear, unforgiveness, worldliness, and a general state of disobedience. Okay? And so that is the number one way that I think most uh, Christians are, are, are fall into sin and, 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 and they're not able to receive the blessings of God that they should be or fulfill their potential because they have fallen into Satan's entrapment. He's hindering them. The second way that he hinders us is we're going to look at number two now. It's another way Satan hinders Christians is by making the church dysfunctional. He attempts to make the church fragment and to fall into error. He does this through false teachers, dissensions, the entrapment of church leaders, apathy, and causing the churches to lose their first love. We're going to examine that. We're going to break this down. Okay. First of all, let's look at uh, uh, false teachers, uh, through false teachers. In, in Pergamos, remember the seven churches of Asia, and it's very enlightening when the Lord spoke to the seven churches of Asia. And in Revelation 2, 14 and 16, he talks to the church of, speaks to the church of Pergamos. But I have a few things against you. He said, yeah, you've done some good things because you have those, uh, they're those who hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the children of Israel to eat things sacrificed to idols and to commit sexual immorality. Thus, you also have those who hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate. Repent or I, else I will come to you quickly and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. He said, I will fight against that church if you don't get rid of this, these doctrines. Uh, that You have the doctrine of Balaam there. You have the doctor of the Nicolaitans there. And basically, Balaam said, well, his motto was, if you can't curse them, then you need to corrupt them. And that's what he did. He caused the children of Israel to fall into idolatry and sexual immorality. And he was able then to get them to stumble again. By, by having this false doctrine um, uh, that he put in front of them. They were compromising. And so the church here at Pergamos is compromising. So we have to be careful about the doctrine that we teach. It's very, very important. Also, in Thyatira, again, we have false teachers there. In uh, 20, uh, same chapter, 20 through 22 and 24. Nevertheless, I have a few things against you. Again, this is the church of Thyatira. Because you allow that woman Jezebel, nobody names their kids Jezebel, right? Our daughter's Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess. 
He said, you, she calls herself a prophetess. She is not a prophetess. To teach and seduce my servants to commit sexual immorality and eat things sacrificed to idols. And I gave her time to repent of her sexual immorality. And she did not repent. Indeed, I will cast her into a sick bed and those who commit adultery with her into great tribulation unless they repent of their deeds. So it's amazing how some people go, oh, I, I'm a prophet or I'm a prophetess. And people just go, oh, I want to hear what you have to say. Okay. You're only, uh, you know, if you're called by God, then uh, you're called by God. If you're called by yourself, then no one really needs to listen to you. Okay. Unless you're following what the word of God says. And so she was teaching them to fall into sexual immorality, which today is rampant in our world today. It's rampant in our world today. Now to you, I say unto the rest in Thyatira, as many as do not have this doctrine, notice this, who have not known the depths of Satan. You get false doctrine, it's the depths of Satan. As they say, I will put on you no other burden. He said, some of you there that are not following the Nicolaitans, and by the way, it was started, the Nicolaitans was started by Nicholas, and basically he was kind of, an antinomian, uh, which meant you, you can do anything you want to uh, with your body. God doesn't care. You can be worldly. You can be careless just as long as you believe in Jesus. But remember, Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. Because there will be people on that day who say, Lord, Lord, uh, we did this in your name. We did that in your name. And he'll say, depart from me. Those who practice wickedness because I never knew you. It's like if... If you love the Lord, you will obey the Lord, right? There's too many people that are compromising. Satan is deceiving them. Jesus even said in Matthew 7, 15, Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. So they're, they're false teachers. They're false teachers. They teach that which is incorrect. 2 Corinthians eleven fourteen. we know this verse. And no wonder, for Satan himself transforms himself into an angel of light. So even Satan, he tries to appear uh, as an angel, a messenger, but his, his, what he teaches or what he promotes will never match up with the word of God. It will always change the word of God in some way. He will always try to get the church to compromise, get you to compromise. It's not really that serious. You can go ahead and disobey God. You don't really have to fulfill all that the Bible says. Yes, you do. Yes, you do. None of us will be able to be absolutely perfect, but we need to strive. The Bible says we should pursue holiness. We should pursue holiness and be quick to repent of our sins. He also likes to cause dissensions in the church, okay? All of us can tell stories of where churches split and they were fighting within the church because they were not humble, they were not forgiving, they were not following the Lord. In James 3, 14 through 17, it says, But if you have bitter envy and self-seeking in your hearts, do not boast and lie against the truth. This wisdom does not descend from above, but is earthly, sensual, and demonic. It's demonic. Notice it says, you're bitter envy, self-seeking, and you're, there's boasting, and ah, da, da. Okay, it says, for where envy and self-seeking exist, confusion and every evil thing are there. Is that not amazing? Every evil thing is there? Yeah, when it's all about you, everything, every evil thing can come in. Because it was all about Satan. Satan wanted to be God. And so when it's all about you and you exist and you fight and you try to get yourself one up on somebody else, every evil thing can exist there. But the wisdom, this is how we are to be as Christians, true Christians walking in the spirit. But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, meaning holy, then peaceable, a gentle Willing to yield, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. That's, um, there's a whole sermon there. There's a whole sermon. We can't pause there, but that's how we should be. I want to be around people that are like that, that are pure and peaceable and gentle and willing to yield and full of mercy and good fruits. And they don't show partiality and they're without hypocrisy. Those are the type of people we're supposed to be. Also, he tries to entrap church leaders. And again, in, in, you know, there can be 
10,000 good pastors, but you get one pa bad pastor or uh, somebody stumbles, uh, then it's going to go in all the newspapers, right? I mean, because the devil loves to throw that out there. But I had an old pastor friend. He said, church leaders, pastors, and others in leadership in churches, they're entrapped by either, there's the three things that the devil uses, fusses, females, and finances. <laughs> yeah. A little alliteration there, but fusses, females, and finances. And that's pretty self-explanatory, all right? Um, it, what, he, what he causes to do, those that know better, those that are church leaders, they know better, but he causes them to make foolish and sinful and, 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 and bad decisions, sinful decisions. Also, he tries to make the church apathetic. And you know, probably in general, this best describes the church in the United States today. I think we're kind of lukewarm. Yeah, kind of lukewarm. I really do. In, in Laodicea, when, when the Lord spoke to the church at Laodicea in Revelation 3, it says, I know your works, okay, that you're neither cold nor hot. I wish you were cold or hot. So then because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Yuck. Because you say I am rich and have become wealthy. Okay, you see materialism come in there. We're rich, we're wealthy, and I have need of nothing. And do, and do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. And so if we pause there just a minute, they fell into materialism. Listen, we have a big building. We have, uh, you know, uh, a, a great uh, uh, great seats and we have a great fellowship hall and we're able to send money here and there. We really don't need anything. And he said, you're lukewarm. You're lukewarm. And Satan likes to say, chill. Don't get too radical. Don't get too vocal. Don't get too evangelistic. You just need to chill. And that's when we become lukewarm. And God said, you need to be hot for me. Uh, verse uh, 19, uh, it says, as many as I love, I rebuke. Okay. And chasten, therefore be zealous and repent. Just like a good uh, uh, earthly father would rebuke his children and chasten them, he will do the same with us. He said, I, I want you to be zealous. I don't want you to be lukewarm and I want you to repent. And so we need to always examine our relationship with the Lord. And it's very, it's very close to the next point. He, he causes churches try to lose their first love. Uh, in the church at Ephesus in Revelation uh, two, four through five. He was the beginning of this, a couple of verses earlier. He said, you did some good things. You're doing some good things. Nevertheless, I have this against you that you have left your first love. Remember therefore where you, from where you have fallen, repent and do the first works or else I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand. You're not going to be a church anymore from its place unless you repent. Wow. Do you realize that our relationship with Jesus Christ is first and foremost a love relationship? And if we lose our passion and we have to watch it not to lose our first love and, and not to lose our passion for the Lord. And sometimes we go through dry places and sometimes I'm guilty. I'm like, I, I lose my passion. I have to repent because Satan likes to get you lukewarm and just forget, you know, just lose that passion, that love that you have for the Lord, because God is love. And that is the essence of our saving relationship with Jesus Christ. It is a love relationship. And I hope you at times just say in your prayers, Lord, I love you. I love you, Lord. Because he loves us. And that's why he died on the cross for you. Because he loved you so much. That he was going to make a way for you to escape the power of Satan. And have eternal life. By dying on the cross. And so one of these days I think when we get into heaven. We're just going to understand how much God loves us. It's, we're just going to experience this tsunami of his love. And we're going to go wow. That is just amazing. So what's your love? Yeah. What, where's your heart? And remember Isaiah said, this people, they honor me with their lips, blah, 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 blah. But their hearts are far from me. There's no love there. Watch your heart. Watch your heart. And then, thirdly, the way that he attacks us, 
Finally, if Satan can't get you to disqualify yourself or cause the church to be dysfunctional, he will attack you overtly and directly. He can't get you to compromise, okay, and he can't get the church messed up. He said, I'm just going to come at you directly like a bulldozer. And he does this through governmental and religious persecutions, through depression and discouragement. And some interesting things here, the last couple, sickness and illness and even natural disasters. Is that in the Bible? Yes, it is. I'm going to show you in just a little bit. But one of the things that uh, just kind of the frontal attack that he does on us is through government and religious persecution. We know that Paul was persecuted over and over again, that 10 of the original 12 di uh, disciples, they died. Uh, uh, they were martyred by the government, by the Romans. And some, you know, the government, the Romans were incited by the Jews. But in Revelation uh, 2, 8 through 10, the Lord is speaking to Smyrna, the church at Smyrna. And he says, and to the angel or the messenger of the church in Smyrna, it could have been to the pastor. These things says the first and the last who was dead and came to life. I know your works, tribulation and poverty, but you're rich. Don't worry about it, that you don't have much. You're rich because you are with me. And I know the blasphemy of those who say they are Jews and are not. Remember, we went through all of that. They say they're Jews, but they're not circumcised of the heart. Physical circumcision doesn't mean anything. They have to know Jesus to be a true Jew. He was the Jewish Messiah. Duh. You miss him, you miss God. You say you know God, but you reject Jesus. You don't know God. Because if you knew God, you would know Jesus, all right? Uh, 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 let's see. And I know the blasphemy of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Whoa. Do not fear any of those things which you are about to suffer. Indeed, the devil, here he comes again, the evil one, is about to throw some of you into prison that you may be tested. And you will have tribulation ten days be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. Some of them might have even been killed. But he said, the devil is going to throw some of you into prison, and you're going to be tested. Now, there it is. You were going to be tested for 10 days. Was it a literal 10 days? We don't know. Was the devil behind, behind it? Absolutely. It says the devil. Now, the devil didn't show up and say, hi, I'm the devil. I'm going to throw you in your prison, into prison. But he incited the leaders, the government. He incited them against the Christians, the believers, and he caused this to happen. Most theologians believe that the 10 days probably represented 10 years. We know that the most severe persecution of the church was under Diocletian, and it lasted 10 years. And it was a very, very hard persecution. It was worse than under Nero, under the Roman emperor Diocletian. So perhaps he was referring to that. So sometimes the government comes at us, but who's behind the government and who's behind the religious? Sometimes it's religious leaders, but they're here. He said they were uh, the synagogue of Satan. Uh, Satan is behind it. Also, I think it's sometimes just depression and discouragement. I think he just comes at us with a spirit. I don't think Satan can possess, a, 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 a demon can't possess a Christian, but they can oppress a Christian. Have you ever just been down in the dumps? You don't know why. You just feel like poor, poor, pitiful me, you know, think I'm going to eat some worms or, I mean, I just, life is just, bleh. you just, you've lost that joy. You just, I don't even know. I believe the enemy can come against us like that sometimes. And, and he can try to get us to be depressed and discouraged and we have to encourage ourselves in the Lord and sometimes say, you know, maybe Satan's behind this. Maybe I need to just start rebuking the devil. And I've done that a few times. I've sent off some Holy Ghost uh, uh, depth charges. I don't know if the submarine of the devil is down there causing sub uh, depression and discouragement. But if he is, I'm going to send off some prayers down there. Okay. I'm going to send off some prayers to blow that thing up and, and get my joy back. Because I think he tries to oppress us that way. Uh, and sometimes that depression can even lead to suicide because he would tempt us to even take our lives. We know that David was troubled many times and battled despair. We know that Elijah was weary and depressed. 
Jonah was angry and wanted to die. And Moses was overwhelmed many times and discouraged and just tired of messing with people. You know, <laughs> the church would go so much smoother if it weren't for the people. <laughs> okay. But, but yeah, he just got, so a lot of the, the, the figures in the Old Testament uh, became very discouraged, uh, very, you know, much just downcast. And when we do that, we just need to get alone with the Lord, just alone with the Lord and just talk to the Lord and ask him just to fill us with his spirit of love, joy, and peace. Get that joy, restoring to me the joy of my salvation, God. And sometimes sickness and illness Really? Can, can Satan actually do that? Well, in Luke 13, 16, it says Jesus had healed a woman. And he said, so ought not this woman being a daughter of Abraham whom Satan has bound? Think of it. For 18 years be loose from this bond on the Sabbath. He says earlier in verse 11 that this woman was crippled by a spirit of uh, for 18 years. He didn't mean a godly spirit. He meant a demonic spirit. So yes, there are times that's just physical. Our, our illnesses, our, our whatever is wrong with us is, is not caused by a demon. But here Jesus says that she was crippled for 18 years and it was caused by a de demonic spirit who was under the authority of Satan, whom Satan has crippled, has bound for 18 years. Okay, that's the reason we need to live right. Okay, we don't need to give the, the, uh, Satan any opportunity to come in and throw something in our lives like that. We even know that Job suffered boils and all of that. And in, in Job 2, through, uh, 2, 6 through 8, it says, And the Lord said to Satan, Behold, he is in your hand, but spare his life. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord and struck Job with painful boils and the sole, from the sole of his foot to the crown of his head. And he took for himself pot, a pot sherd, which means kind of, you know, a scrap of uh, broken pottery with which to scrape himself while he sat in the midst of the ashes. Yuck. Who did that? Satan did. Jesus healed that woman that had been bound. So sometimes he will come at us even that way. And it may be rare. I don't know. We don't know. But it is one of his, in his bags of in his bag of tricks and we need to pray that's why we need to pray without ceasing really yes pray without ceasing because you never know what he's going to try next also maybe he'll try natural disasters can satan sometimes affect the the, the atmosphere or nature yes he can in job 1 16 while he was still speaking, one messenger was speaking, another also came and said to Job, the fire of God fell, and this wasn't caused by God, this was Satan behind it, but this is just what the messenger thought. I think it was a severe lightning storm. The fire of God fell from heaven and burned up the sheep and the servants and consumed them, and I alone, alone have escaped to tell you. So there was some kind of severe lightning uh, storm. I've seen where quite a few cattle have died before being struck. They've been all together in a rainstorm and a, a lightning bolt struck and killed, you know, multiple uh, heads of cattle. So that happened. Also, we know that his sons and daughters uh, in, in verses 18 through 19 while he was still speaking, a messenger, another also came and said, your sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in their oldest brother's house. And suddenly a great wind, which Satan caused, came from across the wilderness and struck the four corners of the house. And it fell on the young people and they are dead. And I alone have escaped to tell you. So who was behind that? Satan. So I may, I may start looking at tornadoes a little differently, like Satan, I, repeat, I don't know, but he, he, he caused that to happen. And so it would seem that at times Satan can use the forces of nature against us. It seems that way. It's, it's here in the Bible. And so that's why we should always pray and Lord lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil or the correct translation is the evil one. And deliver us from the evil one. We should pray that daily. Lord, deliver us from the evil one. So, we've seen how he fights us. He, he tries to get us to, to uh, sell, uh, disobey God and, 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 and cause our, uh, uh, 
us to be disobedient to him and, and our downfall is self-inflicted or he causes, tries to cause the church to be dysfunctional, has false teachers come in, causes dissension and our, ch our churches to grow lukewarm and lose their first love. Or he can use uh, whatever, I, he just comes at you f uh, directly with the government, uh, with natural disasters, with sickness and illness or depression and discouragement. Those are some of the, the tools that he uses against believers, okay? And I've kind of wondered, if, if he has to have permission to come at believers, then we are under a test. But then does he have to have permission when those that are not saved, does he have to have permission from God to afflict them or attack them? I don't know. Maybe. I'm not sure. That's why we should even pray for our unsaved children and grandchildren and relatives and friends. We should stand in the gap and help protect them from the evil one so that they will have an opportunity to repent. So how do we fight the good fight? How, how do we do that? We need to wrap up. First of all, we need to put on the full armor of God. And I'm going to read about whatever, eight or so verses here. But it says, uh, put, uh, how do you fight the good fight of faith? Put on the full armor of God, resist the devil, claim your power, and be aware of the devil's schemes. Let's look at this first passage, Ephesians 6. And I'm going to read it all just because it's, it's self-explanatory and I'm not going to break it down because again, there's two or three messages right here. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Okay, like our Bible verses we say. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles or the schemes or devices of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. It may appear that way, that you're fighting against people, but it's really Satan behind it. But against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. He, it's kind of like an army. Satan is the head. He's the head general, but he has others under him in ranks. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. And having done all to stand, stand therefore having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, having, and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace, above all taking the shield of faith with which you may be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. He's going to get you to doubt God, he's going to get you to doubt the Bible. He's going to get, get you to doubt the, the promises of God. But you hold up the shield of faith. He's going to get you to doubt whether there's a real heaven. He's going to get you to doubt whether there's a real hell. There is. Hold up the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one, of Satan. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, Praying always with all prayer. Notice that, putting on the whole armor, but also polishing it with prayer. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit. Being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for the saints. We're to be praying. That's a lot. A big sermon is right there, but you, it, it's pretty self-explanatory. We need to put on the whole armor of God and wear it. Wear it all the time. Also, submit and resist. James 4, 7 says we're to resist the devil. But before we do that, submit to God. You can't resist the devil unless you submit to God first. Therefore, submit to God. Then resist the devil and he will flee from you. You have the greater power in the name of Jesus and he will flee from you. And I would tell you my story when I encountered a demon, but I don't have time this morning. But the name of Jesus... Uh, Knocked him back really hard. Claim your power. First John 4, 4 says simply, you are of God, little children and have overcome them because he, meaning Jesus, who is in you is greater than he who's in the world. We have superior power because we have Jesus and the Holy Spirit. We're born of the Holy Spirit in us. So we don't have to fear him. We can fear, though, falling into disobedience. You just do everything that you know to do. And, and, you know, you, have, you, will, you will have the greater power over him and he will flee. Luke 10, 17 uh, and following says, Then the 70 returned with joy, saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. And he said to them, I saw Satan fall from lightning from heaven. I believe that's when he rebelled against God and he fell. 
Behold, I give you authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this. So what should we be happy about? That the spirits are subject to you, but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. Yeah, he said, that's, that's part of it. You're going to have power in my name over the, the demons. And you do, you do. But rejoice mainly because your names are written in heaven. You are a child of God and you're going to inherit all things one of these days. And then just don't be ignorant of the devil's devices. Just, you know, if, if something is coming, if you know something is coming, you can watch out for it. You can watch out for it and you can be ready for it. Uh, 2 Corinthians 2.11, 2.11 says, Lest Satan should take advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. So he said, be watchful, be vigilant, you know, because we're not going to be ignorant. We're, we're not going to be caught off guard by surprise. So let me, let me conclude this morning uh, on this kind of part of spiritual warfare about how cinder, uh, Satan hinders us. Uh, we know this, that Jesus Christ came to destroy the works of the devil. 1 John 3, 8 tells us that. It says, he who sins is of the devil, for the devil has sinned from the beginning. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. Hallelujah. Okay. And, you know, it, the devil is still around. He's still, we're still fighting the good of faith. But one day he will be vanquished. We know in Romans 16, 20. Uh, I love this. And the God of peace will crush Satan under your feet shortly. Hallelujah. Just going to stomp on that old serpent's head. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. And it's interesting that the God of peace is doing a violent act. But he has to crush Satan's head. All right. Because if Satan is running around forever throughout all eternity, nobody's going to have peace. All right. So God said, I'm going to put a stop to that evildoer. I am going to stomp his head. I'm going to crush his head one of these days. And it will happen. It started at Calvary. And it will end up when he throws Satan into the lake of fire and brimstone one of these days. So Satan's final dem demise is certain. And your victory, Christians, brothers and sisters in Christ, is certain. Your victory is certain. Therefore, we just must continue to fight the good fight of faith. Let me tell you a little story. Uh, I, when I went over to Africa several times I had to get the uh, yellow fever shot and uh, our vaccine and, and it kind of makes you sick you kind of feel like you have it but but I found out something really interesting about the yellow fever at, at, at one time they thought it was caused by a bacteria and they didn't really know what caused it and then in 1927 a blood specimen was taken from a a, a native in in West Africa named Asibi Asibi was an African and, and he was sick and they thought he had this yellow fever. So they took his blood sample and they discovered it was a virus. And then what they started doing is uh, using that virus they found in his blood from this humble native. For, and they started putting it in cultures and reproducing it from one laboratory to another laboratory and cultures all over the world by enormous multiplication. And they were able to come up with a vaccine. And for many, many years, I don't know if they still do it, but for many years, many decades, the yellow fever vaccine came from the blood of one man, a CB. And that, that the blood and the culture they found of the yellow fever was able to go all over the world and create a vaccine against it. And so by the blood of this one man, you know where I'm going with this, millions of lives were saved. The Bible says by the blood of Jesus Christ that we're saved. By the blood of the God man, Jesus Christ. And there's no other payment. There's nothing else that can wash away our sins. What can wash away our sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. When Jesus died on the cross for you and for me, there was a mystery there in that blood. And that blood can cleanse every sin. 
from your life and my life because he took our sins upon himself and somehow in the deep recesses of God's wisdom and understanding, that blood was the perfect uh, sacrificial uh, thing that was required to make us holy and pure in God's sight. It was the blood, the blood of Jesus. And he was the lamb of God, the perfect lamb of God. And so as I close this morning, listen, you can't be neutral in this, in this ba battle with, with Satan. You're either with God or you're under the power of Satan. There's no neutral ground. There is no neutral ground. You're either saved and delivered by the blood of Jesus Christ by putting your faith in him because in Revelation it says they overcame Satan by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony and their testimony was that I have put my faith in Jesus Christ and when you put your faith in Jesus Christ that blood that was shed on Calvary comes to you and washes away your sins completely it does that and so if you don't know him this morning if you don't know Jesus as your personal savior, if you have never been washed in the blood of the lamb, that's what salvation is, is taking all your sins away because what Jesus did on a cross almost 2,000 years ago, you need to do that this morning. Because if you don't know Jesus, you're not gonna get to heaven. And if you're under the power of Satan, he's gonna tell you that hell's not real. Don't worry about it, just chill. Just go along and be a good old boy or good old gal. And one of these days, just see what happens. That is, is, is a lie. That is a very de uh, uh, common deception that Satan uses all over the world. I need to, you need to think about it. Everybody needs to think about it. One of these days, I'm going to die. And then what? I don't want any surprises. Do you? I, I know I'm going to heaven. I know I'm going to heaven. And uh, I hope that everyone that hears my voice today will know that they're going to heaven before the service is over. And we're ending right now. I'm going to give you an opportunity here or on social media. If you don't know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, just say this, per this, this simple prayer to him, to Jesus. Just repeat after me. Dear Lord Jesus, please come into my heart right now and forgive me of my sins. I now receive you as my Lord and my Savior. Thank you for shedding your precious blood for me on Calvary and dying there for me. And also thank you, Lord, that on the third day you resurrected you ascended into heaven and Lord now you're waiting to come and receive me one of these days Lord I now follow you completely I give my life to you in your name I pray Jesus amen if you prayed that very very simple prayer and it's really not just a formula but it's 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 just what you want to do with your heart you want to give your life to Jesus you want to turn from your sins you want to repent of your sins and that's what salvation is all about and so if you've done that you tell somebody you tell somebody if you're sitting at home sitting on the couch you say I prayed that prayer this morning if you're here this morning you come forward and say I prayed that prayer this morning or if you have another need you come forward this morning will you do that okay would you please stand as we if you prayed that prayer this morning to accept the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, then please contact us here uh, at Two Lakes Baptist Church so we can pray for you and so we can uh, maybe send you some information to help you grow in your relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. And our contact information is on the screen. You can call us, you can write us, uh, you can email us, or if you would like to become a media member or donate to our church, you can go to our website at twolakesbaptist.church. And you can find more out, uh, information out about our church. And uh, we just want to be in contact with you. We want you to know that we care for you and love you. So until next time, may God bless you and keep you and give you peace.